Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to the first guide in my series for Total War Three Kingdoms. I'll be making short specific videos across a range of subjects to help you understand the game better. Today we start with the economy. The economic system in Total War Three Kingdoms is a bit more complex than in previous Total War titles. Understanding what influences it will help you run a much smoother campaign than just trying to build things that generate revenue or monitoring how expensive your armies are. As always, let's dive in. We're starting with the basics here. Looking at the treasury tab, your economy at its core is made up of income and expenses. In terms of income, there are four main types, commanderies, trade, diplomacy, and other. Your expenses include unit upkeep, character salaries, buildings, diplomacy, and politics. You'll notice underneath is your one-off incomes and expenses. These are just things that will happen within your turn. And we can't forget tax levels either, which comes with its own benefits and negatives. Your commanderies, as I've mentioned before, are simply relabeled provinces and three kingdoms. Within your commanderies, you can have up to three main factors contributing to income, industry, peasantry, and commerce. Certain commanderies have access to unique resources like silk, which provides their own additional income as well. Combining all income types, you get your gross income level. Next comes your tax factor. Right now it's at the standard 100%. Going to our tax levels in the treasury tab, we can see what effects bumping your tax level higher brings. We get a 10% incremental increase to income and a 25% incremental increase to food production, the cost of some unhealthy public order. Moving the slider down sees the opposite results in the same increments. While that is the absolute basics of your commandery incomes, let's break it down a little further, shall we? Population plays a huge part in Total War Three Kingdoms, and that's also true for your income. Your base peasantry income amount is decided on which agricultural buildings you choose within your capital city and any regional agricultural buildings that contribute to said peasantry income. Combine capital and regional settlement buildings that promote this base and increase the percentage received from peasantry to help maximize your income. Your peasantry income receives additional boosts depending on the population size of your entire commandery. As you can see in the Jinjin commandery, at 1.2 million of the 3 million max population, I get a 70% out of 350% peasantry income bonus. With this in mind, speeding up population growth is an ideal strategy to increase your peasantry bonus income. Building Jane's characters in the tech tree are all ways to promote population growth in your commanderies as well. Industry and commerce follow the same basic principle as peasantry without the boost from population, and as such are much simpler to go over. Both have their own base incomes as peasantry. Following the building chains in both the regional settlements and capital cities, you'll find that certain buildings supply you with direct base income, while other buildings complement each other of the aforementioned areas with a percentage boost. These boosts only apply to the commandery in which they're located in. Knowing this, it is logical to see what types of resources your commandery specialize in and use that to determine which buildings to put in them. As I said a while ago, there are some resources out there such as Silk, Spice, and I believe Jade that give their own income outside of the normal three aforementioned resources. These special resources are unique in that their benefits are not necessarily limited to their commanderies. For instance, this Silk Road Market gives a base income in its commandery as well as a 50% increased income from Silk for all Silk resources. Whether or not all actually means every single Silk region or just the ones that you own isn't entirely clear, so in theory you could be helping out potential enemies with their Silk trade, but it might not truly make a difference either way. Going for these special resources will undoubtedly be a good strategy to keep up your income. Income from trade is fairly straightforward, if a bit confusing as far as can be seen. Just like previous Total War games, the amount of your trade agreements is dependent on what resources both factions have to share. But when negotiating a trade agreement, you'll notice an indicator on how balanced your trade agreement is compared to the faction you're wanting to trade with. Trade influence factors into that balance. The more trade influence you have against another faction, the more of the shared profit you receive as income. Of course, technology, buildings, characters, and faction traits can modify trade influence, so if that's your thing, be sure to look out for those. Diplomacy income is very straightforward and as such very short. It is simply your income gathered from diplomatic agreements such as recurring payments and tribute. Note that one turn monetary gains do not count in this section. The other income slot is an odd one. Every faction has estates. These family estates as a base will bring in 2,000 copper per turn. 
Some factions have a modifier for or against that number, but overall it will stay the same. Unfortunately, nothing else can affect that number, and it seems like a random feature that's just supposed to bump up your economy, but it is strange that it can't be modified by more factors in your campaign. Expenses will go much quicker since they are pretty cut and dry. Your unit upkeep plays a huge part in your expenses and will almost always be your number one expense. Hovering over the unit upkeep in the treasury tab will give you a breakdown of what your armies are costing you. Seeing this breakdown will give you an idea on which armies may or may not be necessary. It is a solid strategy in times of peace to recall some of your officers and generals in order to boost your income, allowing you to build up your economy before war inevitably strikes again. Each character in your court will in most cases have a salary. This is much different for Yellow Turban Rebellion officers, but we won't get into that. But as your officers level up, they'll want a bigger salary, so this is something to keep an eye on. If you notice your salary is draining your income, look in your court and see if anyone is actually assigned to a position within your empire. For those that are not, you can simply release them from duty and they'll join the character pool for any faction to pick up. Managing your characters in this manner may actually free up a decent amount of income than you thought possible. There are some buildings that require building upkeep. Usually these costs are pretty low overall and shouldn't have a real effect on your economy, yet it's worth looking at and keeping tabs on just in case. Much like your diplomacy income, diplomacy expenses are from regular monetary payments or tributes given to other factions. To be 100% honest, I have no idea what politics costs would be outside of diplomacy or one-off expenses, I'm not going to go into any further detail on that. I've mentioned this a few times already, but there are several modifiers outside of these that are, but there are several modifiers outside of these essentials to your economy, and they can truly have a massive effect on how efficient it can be. There are a range of technologies that can boost your income. Character abilities and traits can have very good modifiers to a range of income across the board. Find which ones give the best benefits as administrators or even higher court positions to boost your income. Giving characters assignments in certain commanderies can provide boosts like a 75% increase to commerce or industry income, which in a correctly built mining commandery can yield a great deal more money for your empire. Beware that certain events, character traits, and empire growth can cause issues as well. Corruption creeps up as your empire expands, your officials can become corrupt as well, and fires or diseases, things like that, can affect your buildings and your population. Overall, your economy is an ever-changing beast that isn't so easy to comprehend right off the bat. But understanding its inner workings, just like in any strategy game, can give your faction the means to make for a great empire and a much more fun campaign. Thank you all for watching my first in-depth guide to Total War Three Kingdoms. Not every guide will be this long, I can assure you, but I feel it was very justifiable for this subject. Be sure to rate the video, subscribe to the channel for more content like you just saw, check out my social links including Discord as well as my affiliate Games Planet for your video game needs. This is Havoc, and I'll see you in the next one.